hello, nerds. This is the Joe Kelly panel from Dink Denver 2018. Uh, I did not get the Man of Action panel on day one, unfortunately, uh, but I did get Joe Kelly by himself on day two. Uh, day one was Joe Kelly and Steven T. Siegel, the guys from Man of Action. Uh, this, though, is just Joe Kelly by himself, so hope you enjoy it. This episode has been brought to you by the Yay Sports. Are we winning yet? Shirt. Looks a little something like this. You can check it out over at the Teespring store. Teespring.com slash stores slash generally nerdy. Go check it out. There's a lot. There's a bunch of shirts over there. But let's jump into this panel. Quiet on the set. Rolling. Hi, I am Bitsy Tellick. Hey, I'm Hale Appleman. And I'm Walter Kane. I'm Rene Aubergenois. Odo on Deep Space Nine. Michael Dorn, Lieutenant Commando of War, Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, come and see me and hear me and talk to me and listen to me and talk about myself. Hey man, this is Kevin Smith, often considered generally nerdy, and you are listening to what is often considered generally nerdy. On Generally Nerdy. You're listening to Generally Nerdy. Generally Nerdy. Generally Nerdy. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a nice welcome to Mr. Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for going. Can you hear Joe? There we go. Cool. I think they're also recording this, so we're off to a great start. Excellent. Okay. This is this is this Late is. Re- and- <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, they can do a, a drop, and they'll just cut all this out. <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll start off with a few questions, um, and then I'm sure you all have uh, some burning questions uh, for Mr. Kelly here. So but I'll get us started. In, so be thinking of that, and then um, we'll open up to the audience. Um, so you know, we've we've uh, you know both at the screening we did at the Alamo, and then at our panel yesterday with, with Steve, we kind of touched on a lot of things, a lot of different aspects of your career. Um, but maybe we can kind of get a little more granular about it, and kind of drill down on you know maybe like um, you know your your start your start in the in the industry and. Um, maybe some of the early challenges and um, some of the early things you kind of overcame to uh, to, to, to make a, a name for yourself. Sure, thanks. Uh, so, uh, how many people want to get into comics, writing, art, etc.? Okay, oh, cool. Almost everyone. Excellent, good. Um, no origin story is the same, just so you know. Uh, so, mine, mine's a little bit weird. I, I went to um, undergrad uh, at Binghamton in New York for art and theater. Um, Party really way too much, which I do not recommend. And as a result, had to graduate with a philosophy degree. Um, long story. <laughs> but I was able to get out on time, which is what I really wanted. And I uh, went to work for my brother-in-law as a, gra- as a production assistant. So I was on sets, I was working on commercials, and um, pretty quickly you sort of learn what you need to know if you want to be in that business, and then you decide to specialize. And I sort of wanted to get back into art, so I hung out with prop guys in the art department and could have head that way. Um, but you also carry a lot of heavy things, and you can see by my spaghetti arms, I'm not really built for that. So I thought, well, I'd like to write. And I applied to uh, NYU's dramatic writing department, uh, shockingly got in. It was like a master's degree program, so there were only 20 people. Why, why, why do you say shockingly? Well, we all assumed that. Uh, we were number 21 and somebody else got hit by a car. That's kind of how we all thought we got into the program. Like nobody really thought, but I, I wrote, I didn't have a script. To, you had to submit a full piece of work. So I wrote a script uh, in a, I don't know, a couple of months, not even uh, very fast, really raw. And that's what I wound up sending in and, and got in on that script. Um, it was back in the days of Smith Corona word processors in case anybody knows. Uh, where you basically had like a three row digital, like that was how you could read everything and then it would print for you uh, forever, which is bizarre, but that's what I wrote it on. Um, got to NYU and wound up working for the department to pay to go, which was great. Uh, they had a graduate assistant program. So while I was there, this is all leading up to the comics mode. Um, while I was there, Marvel Comics wanted to start a program looking for new talent and uh, uh, editors reached out, young editors reached out to the department because one of them had gone to NYU. So at the time, all we did was dramatic, uh, screenwriting and playwriting. There was TV classes, but it wasn't really a focus. And comics were just like, that was, who would write for comics? So the secretary and I had had a lot of conversations about how she learned how to read uh, through Superman comics. 
she saw the pictures and wanted to know what was going on, and that was how she learned how to read. So one day she says, uh, hey, there's a letter with Spider-Man on it sitting on the director's desk, and it'll probably go in the garbage. Um, so maybe you want to do something about that. And I, so I stole the letter, and I do not recommend male felonies as a way to get into your uh, to your first unless career. it works. Yes, unless it works. Uh, but I took the letter and I read it and I saw that they wanted to do this program and then I graciously volunteered uh, discreetly and I said, hey, I heard Marvel contacted you. I read comics. So I, you know, if there's something you want to do, oh, yeah, yeah. And she happened to be a playwright. She would have had no interest whatsoever. So uh, I really tell that story because when the opportunities present themselves, you just have to go for them. Uh, try not to break any laws. But you never know who you're going to meet when something is going to cross your path, and it's kind of the you know the yes sign that's blinking at it. It's like you just got to kind of say yes and go for it. So I ran the program with these editors, and in a short period of time, uh, they saw that we started with dialogue. We worked from dialoguing backwards to world building uh, in the course of a year, and uh, it was called the Stanhattan Project, which was sort of fun after Stan Lee, and um, and they offered me my first job. Uh, so I, I did dialogue over uh, Carl Kiesel on a uh, Fantastic Four 2099 issue, and very illustrious beginnings. And then that led to some like what ifs and uh, Marvel fanfares. And once you're sort of a warm body in one of the big two companies, they start throwing a lot of work at you. Um, and then I got Daredevil shortly after that. Went from Daredevil to Deadpool. Uh, Deadpool was a book they expected to be canceled after six issues, uh, which is probably the only reason I got it. Because uh, again, new editor, new writer, they're like, ah, this book's gonna go away, who cares? Uh, so we were, nobody paid attention to what we were doing, and we were able to get away with the humor and the stuff that you know, kind of has helped shape the character to what you know of today. I was on that book for three years, um, then I worked on the X-Men uh, with Steve Siegel. Um, and it, it was fun, I, I graduated NYU, got married, and started the X-Men literally in a two week period. <laughs> so it was kind of a wild time. But that, that was the, really what launched my career uh, in comics. And uh, I was very lucky. And meeting Steve, as we talked about yesterday, was kind of the genesis of Man of Action, uh, which is a company that I formed with uh, Duncan Rulo and, and Joe Casey and Steve Siegel. And we do animation, and then we do film and TV and a little bit of everything. So that's the long-winded origin story. But the, the takeaways hopefully are, uh, you know, work work hard and don't drink in college too much. That's very important. Um, but when these weird opportunities pop up, you got to kind of grab them and, and just not be afraid. Uh, I didn't know if that script was any good. I still, it was a totally bizarre script that got me into NYU. It was really weird. It was like a disturbing Wizard of Oz kind of riff that was in, really, really insane. Um, but it worked. You know, you don't get anywhere unless you put yourself out there. Uh, and it's the hardest thing for many of us to do because we're often by nature introverted people. Uh, we, we work in our little caves and we draw things or write things and we have to put them out. And luckily living in the 21st century, you have the ability to do that without a printing press. The internet is your friend and you just have to be a little bold and go for it. And because most of the audience are, are people that are, are creators and, and interested in getting into this field, you know, maybe you can use examples both from Marvel and, and Man of Action what does like the the organization and like the hierarchy look like in terms of a, a team that might be working on a book or a comic? Like, what is that? You know, uh, you know, if say someone wanted to, you know, start their own collective or start their own company, like, what is what is what does the team dynamic look like? <laughs> well, yeah, man of action. As we were saying yesterday, man of action. We we've uh, just accidentally succeeded for the <laughs> last eighteen years. Um, you know, it's kind of like wrangling cats, and then. Uh, and we've been together for so long, now it's like working with your brothers, you know? But we, what we tried to do as a group was um, carve out, the most important thing was to have a foundation of trust, which it actually did take us a long time to do. We all had worked together on the X-Men books and the Superman books and enjoyed sharing ideas for the big two, and then we thought we should try doing it on our own. Uh, but what happens is your ego inevitably leaps up. I mean, you have to, and you have to fight for your own work, there's no question. But if you're gonna work with other folks, the trick is to know when you need to protect an idea and when you need to listen. 
And that goes across the board. So even if you are working for one of the big two, like I'm, I'm writing, so I, I write for my artist. If the artist comes back to me and says, I think I can do this in less panels, or I'd really like to explode this scene, or I feel like you missed a beat, they're, they're my first line of defense, even before an editor. Because the books at Image, I have no editor. Um, so Ken was invaluable on Eiffel Giants. Max always was fantastic for Four Eyes, and you know, Diego on Bad Dog, everybody. You have to trust your artist. So if you try to put a collective together, you're gonna have the things you wanna do. Other people might have a different angle. And as long as you take that thoughtfully, you can reject that angle. You say, that's not really what I wanna do. But as long as you're thoughtful about it, A, you might find something that you didn't expect, uh, and B, you won't, the other people don't feel then rejected. Because that's a, just a blanket no is always very frustrating. So hopefully uh, you create you know, uh, an atmosphere of support and synergy. Um, it's something special. I, I've been very lucky when I'm at the big companies that my editor has been very, very collaborative and cool. And their job is ultimately, they have two jobs. It's protect the characters because you're working on legacy characters who are 60 years old, 70, 80 years old for Superman. Um, they have to protect the character first, and then second is to pull out the story that you want to tell. That's what the best editors do. So the, and I've been really lucky. I mean, I've had editors that go, you went down the wrong alley on this. Are you trying to say X or Y? And I'm like, well, I'm trying to say Y. And they said, well, this is screaming X. Um, and then you go, oh yeah, you're right. And you go back and undo it. Uh, not being afraid of that process is, is really critical, not being too precious. Let's, let's go to the other side of the spectrum because that's invaluable information. But like, and you've you know obviously you know worked with you know people like Steve you know who, who have been has been an amazing partner to you, and then even on the film you know like the Giants with Anders. What is the what are maybe some of the, the the red flags that come up when you are maybe working with somebody where you're like this we're going down a really bad path right now. Maybe we need to either step away from this project or we're not jiving. Like, what's the easiest way to be like? I don't know if this is something that. I, I should be doing. That's a, that's a really great question. And sometimes, unfortunately, you don't know the lights or a train until you're at the end of the tunnel. But um, trusting your gut is huge on that. Like, you, even, even for those of us who are introverted or stay at home, and uh, you, you get a sense of somebody very quickly. And whatever it takes for you to get to that place, you are almost always right. I, I can't emphasize that enough. We're so quick to want to collaborate and so desperate to get into the field of our choice that sometimes we'll make compromises. Some of those compromises are worth it. Sometimes it's like, all right, this is not the greatest colorist in the world, but they can get the job done. It's more important for me to finish a book than not. And that's okay. But other times you just get a sense, uh, this person is going to be difficult. And that happens in the very first meeting. But then you talk a little bit more like, oh, everybody can have an off day or, you know, oh, they're not gonna be that bad. I guarantee you four months later, they will be difficult. And um, you have to trust that inner voice. And, and not, and you know, compromise is critical. I mean, we're, we're in a collaborative medium, unless you're a novelist, and even then you still have editors and publishers, but uh, on a film especially, hundreds of people working, uh, in animation, scripts, even on a very short script of divvied up among teams, so you don't know who's touching what, uh, it's, it's a, you just have to have a lot of faith. And so when you know something's not, not going right, you have to sort of dodge that person. The other thing is to go, uh, and people hate it when we do this at the booth, but it's kind of amazing to watch their faces. Somebody will come over with art, uh, especially if it's something they've printed, it makes it worse. But uh, I say, would you pay $5 for this? And you just see their faces drop, even though they made it. And it's because they knew they did it just to get it done. They had a friend that could draw. The friend, they knew the friend couldn't draw great, but they did it anyway. And now they have 22 pages of something that they personally wouldn't buy. If you're in that position, if you see that evolving, you have to put the, the brakes on it because you go too far down a hole. And it might be uncomfortable, but it's, you're, then it's a compromise that you're actually undermining your own ability because editors especially, and, and buyers and publishers, they look at the visuals first. If you're a writer, they're not going to go, well, okay, I don't like the way it looks, but let me read the whole story. I've never heard any editor say that, <laughs> ever. Um, so the visual is so critical, and you'd be better off having one or two pieces of test art and then showing somebody a short script than a whole book that is not well done. Um, that can be really challenging, 
Um, and your barometer for taste is, again, it's a gut check. I'm not saying everything should look like Jim Lee. I'm not saying everything should look like insert favorite artist here. Um, but it's the vision that you have. If you have a vision and it's being properly executed and it doesn't look like anything anybody's ever seen, great, that's totally fine. As long as you're getting to the place you need to get to. Um, same with writing, it doesn't matter what your art form is, I think. Because you can tell, um, especially when you've been around a little while, we can tell if somebody's executed what they wanted versus uh, tried to copy style or just didn't fulfill the vision. Yeah, you can usually see where the first page looks great and then by page five it's like, you know, they got tired, they didn't really want to work on it. Um, all those things become very clear. So make sure it's something you want to do, make sure it's something your collaborator wants to do and that they are as excited as you are and that they lift you up. You know, I get pages back from Max or from Ed McGinnis or any of these people and I get inspired. Like I see Ken, Ken is you know co-creator of I Kill Giants, even though I had written the script years before I met him. Barbara is his design. You know the John, the Titan is his design. Like everything came from from Ken's. Uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes people are like, "No, you made it up." I'm like, "Yeah, I made something up that if if I left it in the drawer, it's a script. It's useless." Uh, Ken brought it to life, so that's why you know we're partners. Um, and as soon as I would see his stuff, I get more excited. And it was not the way I originally thought, ever envisioned it. I had other friends who were artists that were gonna be lined up for that book, uh, and they dropped out for various reasons. So the idea of doing it in a manga style never occurred to me, etc. but he was so confident, his line work was so confident, his design work was so strong, I was like, oh, this is gonna be amazing. So um, have the faith that the thing you wanna see is somebody else wants to see. And don't worry about like how the market works and all that sort of stuff. I, I think that's a rabbit hole you don't want to go down, especially if you're new. Let's let's expand on that a little bit in terms of like, you know, yesterday you and Steve were kind of talking about the you know, themes versus kind of writing what you know, like especially for someone who might be uh, younger in age or even younger in their career. Um, you know, what are some 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 tips that you would think like? would help someone kind of generate, like, this is the story I want to tell, or this is how I achieve the story I'm trying to bring to life, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. It's, um, so you traditionally hear, write what you know, uh, draw what you know, whatever. Um, and we don't say that anymore. It's, it's write who you are and, and draw who you are. You know, if you are an expressionistic painter and that's what your figures should look like, that's what you should be drawing. Um, Max Fumar, who works beyond Four Eyes, uh, his first work was at DC uh, on Infinity Inc. And it was, he basically was told, John Cassidy is one of the hottest artists right now, you should draw like him. And, uh, and so he was doing a photorealistic style that was stiff, frankly, and he knows it. And we talked about it, and then one day he sent me this Christmas card that was really interesting and expressionistic, and I was like, you could draw like this? And he's like, yeah. And I said, well, would you do a book like this? And he goes, yeah, but nobody would buy it. And I said, well, I'll buy it, like, let's do it. And then that became Four Eyes. And then once he started drawing in that style, he got hired by Dark Horse to do Abe Sapien and BPRD and work in Hellboy. So that's how it worked. When he was true to himself as an artist, he got more work. Um, whereas the adapting to somebody else's work did not, it was not gonna lead to more stuff. So when you're trying to generate something on your own, if you're a writer, um, Whatever your preferred genre is, that's fine. The genre is gonna be set dressing, character types, tropes, like it's, it's the candy. Um, and some indicators of plot that are useful, they're very good um, signposts to follow and help you along the way. But it's really gonna be about theme, like what's the story that you are dying to tell and that only you can tell. Um, I know a few people, you know, uh, our life experience is what informs the story. I was, I was thinking about a science fiction book that I really love called The Forever War, and it's old. Um, and it was written uh, by a fellow who came back from Vietnam, and he chose not to write a Vietnam book, he, but he wrote this science fiction book. And in it, there's uh, you know interstellar travel at light speed, and he knew the physics of, well, if you're gonna go that fast, time is gonna be relative and shift differently on Earth. So the whole thing of this story is they will travel three months in hyperspace, have a battle for 15 minutes and then go back to Earth. And Earth is completely changed. They had all this prep time for people to die on this alien planet. They don't even know what war they're fighting for. And then when they come back, Earth is irrecognizable. 
that was his Vietnam experience, but he didn't have to sit down and go, this is a Vietnam story. He, he chose to write in science fiction and wound up writing many, many science fiction books. That to me is a really clear example of writing who you are. Um, and it just keeps going, there's a love story. It's a really beautiful book if you have a chance to read it. Um, Joe Halderman is his name. Um, so, so I would say you look for the things that are inspiring to you. Sometimes I, I Kill Giants for me was a, uh, things were happening in my life that were very strong and very personal and it inspired that book. Four Eyes came from just an image. I just had this image of a kid that was barefoot on a cobblestone street with a Tommy gun and a dragon. I didn't know what it was. And then I backed myself into that story. And re and I, I do, at the moment, I'm, I'm into like father-son stories. It's sort of what I'm working on. So like my next thing with Ken is a father-son road trip that my dad was a cop and uh, you know, kind of a larger than life figure in his way. And uh, there's an origin story of my birth that I didn't find out about until I was an adult. Uh, that on the day I was born, he responded to a call where there was an accident and a child had died. And he never got over, literally never got over the fact that on the day I was born, he had to respond to a dead kid. And um, he drank when I was young, but uh, I, I never really saw him drink. And every year on my birthday, he would get drunk. Uh, he couldn't handle it. Um, that, that came to me as an adult. It took me a very long time to even process that. And now, you know, many, many years after he's passed away, I'm like, I think I could tell that story. I understand what that story is. It's um, not that story. It's not literally that. It's more traumatized. He's a much crazier character. My character is much more, uh, you know, <laughs> namby-pamby and wimpy and, and insecure than, uh, than I am in real life. Uh, I hope, um, but that's, you know, it's a story I can tell um, in a genre that I haven't played in before. So um, that's, whatever inspires you, you can hold on to those little like pearls of an image or uh, a genre, you know, and keep them in your pocket, but it's really the theme and what is the, the personal angle. Because if you are moved by it, I was moved by Kill Giants in the writing of it. I would get weepy while I was typing it. Um, I know what the story is for for, it's called Immortal Sergeant with Ken, that I'm doing with Ken. I know that father-son relationship, trying to reconcile, trying to watch somebody deal with their past, I understand what that is. I believe in those stories, and I believe that there's an audience for that story. Um, I don't ever worry about how big that audience is, though. So I, I did a book at Vertigo called Bang Tango, it's the only Vertigo book I ever did. And it's, a, it's like a crime story, and it's about a, like a, a kneecapper gangster who uh, fell in love with a transsexual, pre-op transsexual woman and didn't know it. And when he found out, it messed up his head because he was super macho and then as a result, didn't show up for a job and the boss's brother got killed. So he had to go and hide it. And it become, it's a film noir kind of story. I think we sold a thousand copies. I, you know, like nobody bought that book. But I love that book and I'm proud of it. And the people who come up to me who read it they really enjoyed it. So it's a book for a small audience, and that's okay. So the same thing I was saying before about your art, as long as you know who the art is for, then go for it. You know, it, it, if your expectation is, I want to you know, do a Spielberg movie that will appeal to everybody, that's a different kind of thing. But that's never been my MO, what, even on Superman or the X-Men or anything like that. Anyone in the audience have any questions? Can you tell us what the name of the book draw? Oh, uh, the Forever War. The Forever War. Other questions? Well, since you mentioned a thousand copies is a failure, what how many copies is a success in comics these days? Well, yeah. So for Vertigo, at, at that time, it was considered actually that one probably sold slightly more. I think maybe it was twelve hundred copies. Um, for the big two companies, if they don't make their print costs, it's considered a failure. But for, for example, when we put books out through Image, if we, if we get anywhere close to three or 4,000 copies, we consider that a home run that are, you know, that are bought. Because we also believe that these books have a long life and people will find them. Michael Giants has been in print for 10 years and people keep finding it. And we may only sell a few hundred copies a year, but that's how the audience grows and it becomes kind of thing. But again, that's the big twos version of a success. You know, I mean, 
their their big you know Batman books, etc. will sell in a hundred thousand copies, hundred fifty thousand copies, whatever. Um, something crazy with an exclusive, you get into four hundred thousand copies because it's a loot box, a loot crate exclusive, and thing. We're never in that realm with indie books. It's more about uh, sustained audience and finding a passionate audience. You know, uh, I forget who who talks about it. Um, there's somebody online that talks about uh, an audience of a thousand. They they do just use that number. And if you can get a thousand fans, doesn't matter what your thing is, those thousand true fans are more important than a hundred thousand. Oh, I read it and forgot about it, because those thousand people will propagate. They'll talk. They'll they'll be your street team and get your work out there. But again, I don't. I would. That doesn't mean do a thousand copy print run of anything if you're doing an independent book. You do like what's available and what's accessible to you. Although if you're putting something out online, you don't even have to worry about it. Um, but yeah, it's just an arbitrary number. You know, for me again, for me, it's did somebody come to the, to the booth and they said I love this book or it's meaningful to me, then it's a success. You know, uh, and then it's what can you financially support? Because I, I have books that I've not made a penny on that I fully financed, and that's fine. And then I, books that worked out really well. You know, it's uh, it's a it's a funky industry. <laughs> Have a survival job is another thing we tell everybody, uh, and there's no shame in that because you know I I do the work for me first thing in the morning. Um, so like when I work on Sarge or if the, I'm writing a film for Anders Walter who directed I Kill Giants, that's the first hour and a half of my day without fail. So it'll take me six months to get something done, but that's okay. I'm working for me, and then I'll do the work for Cartoon Network or the work for whoever else we're working on. Um, that's my survival job. Yeah, you know, I happen to be doing it in animation, but uh, if I was you know, waiting tables or I was a PA or whatever that I was doing, that would be my survival job, and that's okay. As long as you make that time and you're religious about it, you do a little bit every day, that's how the work gets done. You know, very few, some people are lucky. Brian came on, he holds himself up for a weekend and bangs out a book and you know he germinates in his head for three months and he writes it in four days. Like, I don't know how you do it. Uh, and Brian was an undergrad while I was a grad, so it always feels like it's in the family. <clears throat> Whenever he has a success, he's a real sweet guy. Um, and he was the second of the Sam Hatton years, so uh, that was cool. But How did you find that routine where you were like, I need to dedicate the first part of my day to me and all work and everything else? Like, how did you come to that, that decision? Uh, for me, I, I, I used to be a night owl. I do tend to stay up late, but um, I, don't, I don't feel like I'm creative at night anymore. That's for videos of people falling down and <laughs> goats you know, fainting and stuff. Um, the mornings are the most fertile times for me. I wake up and uh, sometimes I have a new idea or um, I just feel you're the least influence, especially if you do not open social media, do not turn on the news, do not check the email. So hard, very hard in this day and age. But if you can do that, uh, for me, that's the time. And then I go to I go to Panera. It's not really at all sexy or exciting because uh, I drop my kid off at school. It's right there. Nobody's going to bug me. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, and I just write for an hour and a half. And I don't care if it's good. That's the other thing. We tell everybody everything you love at one point sucked. You can listen to recordings of the Beatles uh, where they're trying stuff out that are not that great. You know? um, so I just write it to get it done, and then the rewriting process is the, the important part. So f for me, that was the best. <coughs> Sorry, I'm drawing out here. Recently, I'm grabbing you some water. <laughs> um, but like Steve, uh, well, let's see, tell you his process, his battle's coming out. Everybody has their own thing. But um, it was, it's trial and error. Really? Other questions? So obviously working at the big two versus doing an independent book are completely different feelings and styles, but which one do you prefer? Uh, now, I mean, I certainly, the, the creating something from scratch, working with an artist really closely and then giving that out to the world is incredibly gratifying. Um, so it, it is my preferred way to do it. Uh, but I've been very lucky to get to work on all sorts of other franchises and stuff. Thank you so much. Um, other franchises, you know, uh, something like, like Deadpool. Um, to have people come up and say, like, you made my Deadpool and all those sorts of stuff. It's, it's a wonderful feeling as well. Or a Spider-Man story that I was a fan of, because uh, I loved Spider-Man growing up. He's always been my favorite. 
Uh, so people say like, oh, that Rhino story you did with Max, it made me cry, and you know, that's a great feeling too. So, but I think now at this stage of my career, I'd, I'd rather keep throwing stuff at the wall that is my own creation. Uh, same with Man of Action. I mean, we do we take on franchise jobs, uh, Mega Man being one of them. But we still try to find our way in, something that puts our thumbprint on it. And uh, meanwhile, it's just every other time, every other free creative minute is spent generating something new. Uh, and it's a tough time for original work. But again, if you're committed to, I'm less worried about the outcome and more worried about, you know, more concerned with the process and focused on the process of getting it done, the audience comes, you know, the buyer comes. And you just have to have faith in that. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Anyone else? Uh, I was wondering uh, how the process happened about getting your comic made into a movie sold or licensed or what happened there? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Eiffel Giants was out. A producer who was working over at Fox, uh, Kyle Frankie, who's on the film, uh, approached me about it. Uh, he was very cool. Uh, we hit it off really well. I'm, again, that gut check. Just a solid guy. And uh, I said, I'm the only person who's ever going to write it. And I had already written a, a spec version of the script, so I was able to show that as I'm not a crazy person, I can actually write a screenplay. Um, sadly, there was a period of time where there were some comics people that were hired to write films, but had not had that training. And writing comics, you can do whatever you want in a script, right? Like Alan Moore famously will write a 65 page script for a 22 page comic, and it doesn't matter. I can describe every light and every, all these paintings. Um, <clears throat> can't do it in, in film, right? A page a minute rule of thumb is kind of what you need in this punchy across the page stuff. So ha I had that and that helped give him a little bit of confidence. And then Kyle moved to a bunch of different companies, but I stuck with him because I liked him. Then people at 1492 found the book. Um, uh, Michelle Miller is also a producer on the film. Two people gave her the book in one weekend. So she was like, well, I guess I should read this book. Uh, liked it, gave it to Chris Columbus. Chris Columbus liked it. And all these were like handshake deals because I also knew that if um, I have learned the hard way, once you have the contract, you're in the contract, right? So since nothing was a guarantee, nobody was putting any money down, nobody was optioning, these were all just handshake deals. So I had that same conversation with Chris Columbus, which was terrifying because I'm like, I'm gonna tell Chris Columbus I'm the only one writing this movie, okay? <laughs> um, but again, to mention Alan Moore, like that lesson of uh, I'm not contentious about anything that I've done being changed or, you know, I love the Deadpool movie and I, I love that stuff that I created is in that movie. Um, but Alan Moore is like, the book exists, right? The book is always there, so I don't need to worry about the film. In this case, the book always will exist. I love I Kill Giants and if there was no movie, I was okay with that. So it gave me the backbone to say these things to people. Once Chris Columbus signed off on that, everybody who came afterwards was like, oh, Joe's writing the movie. I was writing the movie, and that was <laughs> that was a great gift. So it became the opposite of every Hollywood story you've heard about creators being shoved to the side. Um, then you had to get the money for that movie, so then it was courting uh, producers, and uh, Chris decided not to direct it, so then we uh, found Anders Walter, who had won an Academy Award for a short film. Um, really super talented guy, really we clicked, again, gut check, clicked incredibly quickly and well on what we liked and what we didn't like. Uh, our, ins our inspirations, all that stuff. So I knew I was in safe hands with Anders. And, um, and then eventually, when the right money person came along, um, that's when the contracts and things like that came in. The people, uh, you media who ultimately financed the film, uh, they came in. So um, there's a lot of other folks involved with the film. They all sort of came in at various times via Kyle or via other money or whatever. And, and Zoe Saldana, um, once she became interested in the film, she, she's the unsung hero of I Kill Giants, without a doubt, because uh, even though Madison Wolf, who plays Barbara, she's the powerhouse of the film. She carries every scene. It's, you know, it's, her, it's her movie. <clears throat> Zoe really, really took to the script. She was just, I think, uh, had just had her kids. And so she responded really well to the story and stuck with it. And every time money would go away, we were like, oh, we're gonna lose Zoe so now. It's never gonna happen. And she's like, no, I love this story. Tell me when money comes, shows up. And then we would tell that to the next people and it kept going. And then she had a new agent. And as soon as you get a new agent, 
they're like, okay, you're gonna chuck the, all those little independent projects you think you wanna do, and you're gonna sign up for Avatar two, three, four, five, and nine. And, and she's like, yes, I am gonna sign up for those things, but I'm also doing Ikel Giants. And her commitment to us was incredible, and it really helped for a small film to have a, a, a star attached to it. Um, it's, it's just the way the business works. So she really helped protect us uh, and keep things moving. So then when we got to the, you know, to the money folks, then we had a movie. So, and during that whole time, uh, A Monster Calls was, was published, uh, got AJ Bayona attached, had similar theme matter, uh, all this kind of stuff, and we kept getting, uh, losing money and et cetera because of that film. Um, but it all worked out in the end. Both films exist, which is a lovely thing. Uh, so I hope that answers the question. Yeah. So as we kind of wrap up here, um, I just want to mention again, uh, Joe's up on the third floor uh, with Stephen T. Siegel uh, with uh, books and um, has been generous to spend his weekend here. Um, for for people again who are, who are kind of early, maybe early in their career, yeah. what's the best way to get to the next step? You know, whether it's connecting with different artists, you know, getting to you know, obviously you know it's insanely difficult to go from you know book to film right you know, oh, yeah. for what is what, what push you need to make to be like i'm just gonna start slowly leveling up so um there's a fellow named stephen pressfield who wrote a book called the war of art and he always talks about resistance and thinking about yourself as a professional um i actually recommend that book i really like his his writing it's simple it seems overly simplistic but it's all true is that we are our own worst enemy so what we need to do is think of ourselves as professionals. And a professional shows up every day. A professional goes to work at the same time every day. They work, you know, nobody gets plumber's block, right? We claim we get writer's block. And writer's block is always fear. It is a real thing, but it's fear. And so you need tools to get around fear. The same with artists, you know. Uh, perfectionism is fear. How do you get past that? You just finish it, and then you go to the next thing. Finish, go to the next thing. That's what a professional does. Uh, they don't go, I can't finish installing this toilet, right? And what we're doing is not installing <laughs> toilets. It's different, but a, a professional thinks a certain way. So getting yourself into that mindset as early as possible, even if that window only means 15 minutes a day. And 15 minutes a day, you'd be amazed at what you can do for 15 minutes a day. So long as in those 15 minutes, that's it. No Twitter, no this, no email, no whatever. That's really hard. And you know, the people who get to that, they produce things and they finish things. So once something is finished, then it's now I have to go out there. And, I, and now Steve Siegel, who's gonna talk right after me, has his hierarchy of sort of the things you need to do to get ahead. And talent is like four on the list. It might even be five. Um, I'll let him tell you his specific method, but getting to meet people is critical and putting work out there is critical. So will you shift? And shipping can mean put it online, introducing yourself to somebody at a convention. Conventions like this are great because even if there's no publishers here, you're meeting other folks that are at your level or just above your level. Um, not being afraid to uh, put yourself out there, hear the uh, criticisms, accept a little bit of rejection. I, I still have my first rejection letter from DC Comics that I sent them before I went to, uh, to college uh, for my incredible Elseworld story that nobody will ever read. Um, it comes with the territory. You're going to get rejected all the time, but if you take those things and you go, well, this was constructive and that was nonsense, you ignore the nonsense and you just keep moving. Um, if you are looking to go for the big two, aim for, uh, try to get in touch with assistant editors, not just the editors. Um, you know, Marvel and DC both have sort of talent coordinators that are scouts and etc. It's important to get to know them, but if you can meet the assistants, they will become editors, number one. And number two, their, their workload is different. Nobody contacts them directly to say like, hey, I'd like to work with you. I like what you did on Nightwing. You know, let's, I, would you be interested in reading something? Would you meet up? Um, DC is in LA, Marvel is in New York. Uh, the other one's, Image is in Portland. Um, so is Dark Horse. So knowing where the places are can be helpful, but meeting people at conventions is, is a way to do it. And, uh, and again, like I said, a complete product is so critical. So. Um, if you, even if it's a five page story, a 10 page story, but it's complete and it is the best execution of your vision and style, that is more important than the, I kind of have a pitch and here's sort of the idea and here's kind of what the art looks like. 
they're not gonna buy from you at that stage. So uh, be a professional, don't be afraid to meet people, complete the work. That's, that's the best I can give you. It's, it's a tough, it's a challenge. And um, you know, I, I have a short film that I did and I've been sending it to film festivals and I've been rejected from everyone. I've not gotten into a single film festival. I'm proud of the, the film. It's, 20, it's 32 minutes long. That's why it's not getting anywhere, I know it. But I didn't want to do a 10 minute film. It wasn't what I was into. And uh, all I want to do is finish my Kickstarter requirements because I did make promises to people I have to keep. And then I want to make the next one. And the next one, the next one. That's, that's how I'm going to do it. So I'm in that same boat. Like I've, I've hit a certain level of professionalism or success in one arena. But as a director, nobody's ever seen my work. So I want to be a director. And that's what I've got to do. And, uh, and it's terrifying. <laughs> There's like a mixer coming up. It's actually your, your company is involved in it with the WGA and Neon. Oh, really? Yeah, and it's like independent film people. And I was invited to it in New York, and I'm like, I don't know how to talk to people in a, <laughs> at a bar. <laughs> like, I'm, not, I'm not good at it. But I should go, and I should put myself out there and have business cards and meet directors and meet other writers. That's, that's the sort of stuff you do, uh, get myself out of my shell. So that, that, those feelings don't ever go away, by the way. Some people, they're great. Maybe they're so sociopaths or egomaniacs. I don't know. But for me, 20 years into this stuff, I still feel insecure about these things. And it's um, just acknowledging I'm afraid. OK, good. Now go do it anyway. So hopefully that helps get you to the next level. Joe Kelly, Thank you so much, everybody.